Welcome to the Research Conversation edition of the Change Starts Here podcast. I am Jennifer Chevalier, and I am joined by my friends and colleagues, Dr. Eve Miller and Kim Yaris. We are tackling a, a topic today that we hope will push your thinking about how we are approaching education. Okay, Kim and Eve, I want to start off by making a statement and then gauging your reaction to it. So whatever comes to mind, there's no right or wrong answer to this. Here's the statement. Students are leaving the K-12 education system underprepared for the future. So my reaction to that is, eek, yikes. And to some extent, it feels like the message that I hear often from, you know, reading a accumulation of, uh, newsletters and talking to educators. My reaction to it is, you know, we've heard this story for years. The context and the skills are still largely the same that we're talking about when we talk about they're leaving unprepared. Um, so that's just, that's what comes to my mind. It's like, of course, of course they're leaving um, unprepared because we haven't shifted practices to account for this. So okay. how's that for like a bummer of a, <laughs> well, again, we're, we're trying to get at something here so we can try and stretch everybody's view on this and see if we can push us into a productive space. All right. So what I think we're all getting at is that, um, Many students are leaving the K to 12 education system, not um, academically proficient. And we're hearing from employers and even universities that students are leaving without the future readiness skills that they need to be successful. Um, not all students, of course, there are many students that are coming out equipped in these areas, but you know, this is a trend that we're seeing. And so let's start with what's going on in academics. I'm going to state two proficiency statistics from the National Assessment of Education Progress, also known as NAEP, um, from 2022. And I want to know which one is more surprising to you and why. And you could agree have the same one that's more surprising or it could be different, whatever sticks out to you. OK, the first one is 35 percent of fourth grade students performed at or above the NAEP proficient level on the math assessment in 2022. So 35% proficient in math. 32% of fourth grade students performed at or above the NAEP proficient level on the reading assessment in 2022. Which is more surprising to you and why? The reading level was, uh, what was the number? 32% were at or above the proficient level. Math was 35%. I actually thought math would be lower than reading um, because typically those are the trends is that math trends lower than reading. Um, I don't think either of them feel good, right? And if we're talking about proficiency, um, my hope is that more students are proficient than that. So that concerns me. My reaction is the reading. I, I, I think about just how it is a building block, as many of us know, to all the rest of the learning that happens um, going forward. And so we want that so much higher than it is. And I think the math is surprising in that I have read some reports that the math in during the pandemic times, during school shutdowns, actually was easier to learn than people expected, um, whilst pretty much all the other subjects uh, did not do as well through like online platforms, but math. So hearing that it's still so dismally low is, I think they're both a, su a surprise in different ways, yeah. That's an interesting insight. You make me think, you know, when I taught fourth grade math and these are fourth grade statistics, I remember so many parents coming to me like, there's so much reading in math in fourth grade, right? Because everything is contextualized in story problems or word problems. Um, and so just you think, well, someone can be fine in math if they're not proficient in reading, but that's actually not the case with how students are tested in math. So there's definitely a connection there. Um, but to echo what you said, Kim, I think everyone involved in the field of education is like 
deeply grieved by these math and reading proficiency statistics, right? We can't feel good about only one in three fourth graders being proficient um, in core reading and math skills. So, you know, we have to kind of think about it. There are other important content areas that we're not even addressing in these statistics, such as writing, you know, social studies, science, and the list goes on and on. Um, but these are, are just really standout statistics. Um, and so let's think about how maybe the field of education collectively we can do better in this area, because I think all of our kids deserve better than what they're getting. And I think, you know, we all would agree with that. So I'm going to argue and, you know, this these thoughts represent just my own thinking. I argue that the depth and breadth of the academic standards we are trying to teach is a significant barrier um, and really creating a blockage to proficiency in the things that are the most important. Um, we're trying to cover too many standards. And so it's making it difficult for students to master any. And I remember as an educator, you know, you have to go through and check off that you covered all the standards, but you know, like I knew at times I wasn't fully teaching this one, but I had to move on or else I wasn't going to hit all the standards in time. So educators are faced with this tough decision, right? The pressure to say that they taught all the standards and to show evidence of that, but also knowing that some kids are getting left in the dust as we move on to the next thing. So yeah, it's tough. So I think collectively, we want to make the case that teaching academics isn't enough to prepare our students for the future. It's definitely a piece of it and an important piece. But let's explore the idea of helping students develop future readiness skills as a critical part of their preparation. So the skills we've talked about all season are from the Leader and Me Student Leadership Portrait. And Eve, you are an integral part in the development of the original student leadership portrait. So I'm hoping you can spend a little time giving us an overview of it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, but we can uh, put the model in the show notes so th that people can reference it. Uh, this, the student leadership model came from this, um, our thinking on, we wanted to set a commitment around students, like what, a leader in me school could expect from the students who come up through and develop in this leadership model um, that we use through the leader me process. And at what we did with that is we looked at our core content, but we also looked at the research that says, if this is taught to fidelity, what does that look like for a student um, as they grow and develop and have opportunities in the school and in their community to apply these things that they're learning. And from that came the, um, the student leadership portrait. So in the center of it is the whole person. Um, so it's habit seven is what it's based on, but it's also based on the, um, a lot of whole person education um, models where essentially the brain in, and our emotional life, our social life, our ability to learn, our cognition, all of those things are interconnected. And so putting that at the very center, it is a way of setting that as the central point of focus to say, we are never removed from our wholeness as a human. And we need to teach the wholeness and develop the wholeness of these students um, to help them develop into the leaders that we need in our world. And then in that, in a second circle that um, goes around, um, there is both personal effectiveness and interpersonal effectiveness. And within those skills, we focused on the personal effectiveness um, competencies within that, that circle. So just one piece, just a half moon of this larger model. And um, those are really the foundational skills, everything from that we've talked about here of time management, self-awareness, metacognition, so higher order thinking skills. Um, it then goes up to on the top half of the moon, um, the interpersonal effectiveness. And so that is very similar to habits uh, four, five, and six of the seven habits where it's, we take, we have the private victory, it's an inside out model, so we work we work on developing ourselves and then we build each other 
and we build our community and we learn how to interact and build relationships of trust. So um, I'm taking way longer. So that is um, the interpersonal effectiveness are the competencies that help support that um, competencies like empathy, like active listening, like or different forms of communication, learning how to do those well with all the different strengths that come into, you know, your approach to it. And then finally, the outer, um, the outer circle is really taking those core skills and then applying it to situations where there's contribution involved, where there's real growth towards a future. So in that bottom where it goes from interpersonal effectiveness out to lead self, and that's all about how do you set up a life of contribution and purpose, one that you can connect daily with meaning, which is the highest factor of wellness and happiness in life. And then the the top part um, is lead others. And all we mean by lead others is in whatever role you serve, if that is a stay-at-home mom or dad, or if that is a CEO in a corporation, everything in between, there are opportunities for leadership and contribution. And so it's looking for those, bringing a humility and a service-mindedness and just an openness to others um, that I think is really important. So sorry, long answer, but it is a it was a lot of year, a lot of months of development and really listening. And uh, that was that was honestly short. So everyone check out the model. <laughs> you did a great job giving us an overview of that. Thank you. Kim, I'm wondering what connections you can make between the student leadership portrait that you've just described and executive function, since that was one of the themes of this year's um, series. Yeah. So just to kind of recap, there are those three biggies that we talk about, cognitive flexibility, working memory, and inhibitory control. And so like when you take um, a competency like adaptability, um, adaptability and cognitive flexibility, those two are like totally congruent um, and, you know, meet each other. Um, you know, it's something like emotion regulation, one of those competencies that's connected to inhibitory control, right? Like um, how well you're able to regulate your reactions and responses to whatever stimuli are going on around you um, is going to influence um, how well you're able to control yourself in this situation, um, it's going to, which has this domino effect on how well are you able to remember things. Um, and some of the competencies are um, executive functions. So time management is a an, is an executive function. Um, so there is like this very integrated, integral connection between executive functions and the competencies on the student leadership portrait. I'm just, I'm just struck by, when, as Kim was saying, that everything in the student leadership portrait and what Kim is talking about with executive functioning, the critical component of it is the use of it, right? Like, so we're not talking about critical thinking that is an ideal or any of these things, like time management that is right. an ideal for students. In order for learning to happen, there must be doing of that, right? There, It has to go beyond the knowledge acquisition. And so I think that's a critical piece of executive functioning too, is those are pathways in the brain that must be developed in order for them to actually be lasting um, and be effective. That's a great point. And it seems like the education environment is such a great place to practice those skills alongside of the academic learning through independent work, you know, collective work. Um, so that's, that was a great clarifier. So I think the case that we're making here today is that in order for students to be successful academically, they need the skills to help them be effective students. And so what if we narrowed the academic standards to the most critical ones to make space for students to develop these skills so that they can be successful in school and beyond? All right, audience, we are going to leave you to ponder over this question and idea. And it looks like Eve is pondering over it, too. Did you want to add in something quick before I? <laughs> oh, I thought that was a jumping off point because I'm like, I think therein lies, therein lies the push and pull that we think is so necessary when I, I agree that the standards are, yeah, they are what you said earlier. Um, 
I think it doesn't have to be one or the other. Like when we need to make room for it, true integration of the whole person is just good learning. It's just good classroom instruction, good classroom management. It is the right way to bring the whole person into it. And that can be as simple as engaging emotions, right? Curiosity, hope, um, just like their own cultural reference points in learning, which can create motivation for them, recognizing the whole person, these practices at every point in instruction, that, that's all that that is. Like whole person doesn't need to be a thing that we do over on the side. It is the integration of it um, into everything that we do that is actually the, the learner learns, right? Like it's the engine like, and the more that we can develop the whole student and that whole engine, the more we can encourage that brain to learn and to close these gaps that we see. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, let's talk about it. Kim, did you want to build on that? Um, well, I mean, it's a, it, I think it's a great question to kind of linger with and to um, continue to think about, but it, you know, I think the last thing that I would say is that I don't think that you get good academic results by only paying attention to academics, right? If you neglect that bigger purpose of learning, which is to, you know, future readiness is more than just academics. And so if we are kind of working on both simultaneously, I think therein is like the secret sauce where the real magic happens. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us um, for today's conversation. In just a couple of weeks, we will release our final episode of the season. So make sure to like and subscribe to Change Starts Here so you'll know when that episode drops and so you'll be able to join us when our next season kicks off at the end of the summer.